I've heard my whole life that God loves you. And I believe with all my heart that God loves you. But it's often hard to apply his love towards me because I know how insignificant and unworthy I often feel. And as we talk about God's love, I want to start with two questions that I've often asked myself, and perhaps many of you can relate. Number one, why would God love someone as bad as me? You see, I know all the things that I've done wrong. I know all the dark thoughts that I've had. I know all the people that I've hurt. How could God love someone as bad as me? How many of you would say, I often feel unworthy or undeserving of the love of God? In fact, even in the scriptures, you can find a lot of people who felt this way as well. Look at Job. Whenever uh, he really saw God in his purest essence, here's what Job said in chapter 42. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I, what? Despise myself. I don't even like myself. And repent in dust and ashes. And then in the New Testament, Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, 9, reflecting on all the bad things he had done, he says, For I am the, what? Least of all the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. I mean, you can almost hear his insecurity as he goes back through his life and realizes, before I was a Christian, I used to kill Christians. How could God love someone as bad as me? And the second question I've often asked is, why would God love someone so insignificant? Do you ever feel that way? Where you think, seven billion people on planet Earth, and God's got these big things going on, wars, natural disasters, pandemics, poverty, starvation. Who am I? World leaders and, and, and big shots, and I'm just one of seven or so billion people. Who am I in the big scheme of things that God would know me and love me? In fact, when you read in the Old Testament, you can see some of the biblical players who had similar feelings of insignificance. Exodus 3.11, God's going to raise Moses up to deliver the Israelites. God said, here's your job. But Moses said to God, what? Who am I? I'm not good enough. I'm insignificant. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Who am I? David said the exact same words anytime he had the people together and they were going to worship God and give to God. First Chronicles 29, David said, but who am I? And, and where and, and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Like, who are we? I mean, everything comes from you, God, and, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. See, we're insignificant. How could you love someone like me? And I meet people all the time who say they don't believe in God, and, and some just don't. But one guy said, I don't believe in a God who's angry at people and waiting for people to sin, and as soon as they sin, he writes them off and takes great delight in sending them to hell. I don't believe in a God like that. I'm like... Wow, dude, I don't believe in a God like that either. He said, what do you mean? I said, when I read scripture, I read about a God who is just. And sometimes people go to hell. But I read about a God who just loves you because maybe you've heard that your whole life. God doesn't just love, but God is love. You see, love is not just something that God does. Love is who God is. Would you write that down? God is love. Unite your, ver your voices and say that aloud with me. Who is God? God is love. Wherever you are, whatever you might be doing while you're watching this in person or over the kitchen sink doing dishes, say it with me one more time. Who is God? God is love. Scripture says it. 1 John 4, 8. Who is God? God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. Do you want to know how God showed it? Here's how. He sent his one and only son, Jesus, into the world that we might live through him. Do you want to know what love is? This is love. Not that we loved God, but that what? He loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. 
Love is not just what God does, it's who he is. And when we recognize it's not just an action that he does, but it's a reflection of his essence, of who he is, that changes everything. Then we don't just believe it's out there somewhere. God loves you, but because of who he is, there's nothing I can do to earn more love or nothing I can do to stop him from loving me because it's not just something he does. God is love. It's who he is. Let me explain it to you this way, because so many people have a hard time recognizing his love. I put together a list of different types of people that God loves, starting with A's and B's and C's. I could go through the whole alphabet, but that would take too long. So let's start with A's. Who does God love? God loves artists and astronauts and astronauts and aerospace engineers. God loves accordion players, believe it or not, but it's true. God loves ankle biters, animal rights activists, airplane, airplane pilots, athletes, animal rights activists, acrobats, and accountants, especially during tax season. God loves people from Alabama and Alaska and Africa and Albania. God loves absent-minded people, awkward people, assertive people, authoritarian people, antisocial people, and aggravating people. Yes, God loves the person sitting next to you. Who does God love? God loves Babies and boys and bankers and band leaders and ballerinas and Bible readers and biology teachers and bird watchers, bus drivers, bookworms, bachelors, botanists, bowlers, baby boomers, boomerang throwers, beekeepers, BBC watchers, blondes, and brunettes. Who does God love? God loves the boring, the beat up, the burnt out, bosses, braggarts, bag ladies, bartenders, brats, people with braces, bushmen, and Baptists. Who does God love? Sees. He loves Catholics and Charismatics and Congregationalists and Congressmen and Crooks and Creeps and Cheaters and Charlatans and even country music fans. That's how big God's love is. He loves Cubans and Caucasians and Californians and Cambodians and Cherokees and Cajuns. God loves cooks and celebrities, cops, cheerleaders, clowns, cheapskates, comedians, and God even loves people who own cats. I admit it. God even likes people who love the Louisville Cardinals. And God loves Christian Leitner. He does. God doesn't just love, it's who he is. And when we recognize who he is, that he is love, that changes everything. And so the next time you feel unworthy and undeserving, remember this, if you're taking notes, that God's love covers your sins. Jesus shed his blood as a covering for our sins. 1 Peter 4.8, love covers over a multitude of sins. God's love covers your sins. This is so important to me because I've done so many things wrong and I never felt worthy of God's love. So I thought I've got to work harder and I've got to stop doing bad things and I've got to be more religious. And the more I tried to be religious, the more I seemed to do bad things. And it wasn't until I was in college that I started reading the Bible and I, I read that God truly loved me through Christ and I could be made right with him, not by my works, but by the love of God and his grace and through his mercy. And when I understood that, the only way I could describe it is by using the biblical term born again. That's the most accurate statement I could make. I was new. I was born spiritually. There was something in my life that burst to life spiritually, and my old nature was gone, and everything became new, and I was a different person. Not perfect, far from it, but new, becoming more and more like Jesus each day. That was just day one, but it was still evident of what God was doing in my life. All the way back to the garden with Adam and Eve, they sinned. One moment they were naked and not ashamed, and after they sinned, they became naked and ashamed. What did God do? God took the life of an innocent animal, and he covered their shame with the skin of that animal. New Testament, 
when Jesus told a story about a son who left home and partied hard and wasted his father's wealth and sinned and came home filthy, what did the father do? He welcomed him back and he took the robe and he covered him. Do you feel unworthy today? You are. And so am I. That's what makes God's love so beautiful. His love covers our sin. I love the way it's phrased in the book of Titus chapter 3. But when the kindness and what? Love of God, our Savior, appeared. He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but instead because of his mercy. God's love covers our sins. And another thing, when you start to feel insignificant, is this. God's love makes you significant. God's love makes you significant. It is God's love that makes you who he wants you to be. Jeremiah 31, 3, God says, I have loved you with, what kind of love? An everlasting love. I have drawn you with loving kindness. God is drawing some of you today with his loving kindness. But, but you, could, you might ask, there's so many of us. How could God care about me? I feel so insignificant. Well, let me tell you three quick stories. You can read these all in Luke chapter 15. Jesus told three different stories showing the love of God. The first story, there was a woman who had 10 coins, and one day she lost one coin, and she was so upset that she lost that one that she ripped her house apart looking for the missing one. There's another story about a father who has two sons. One son left home, and even though there was another son at home, every day the father went to the edge of town praying, watching, begging for his one son to return. And then Jesus told a third story about a shepherd who had a hundred sheep. And then one of the hundred wandered away. And even though he had 99 left, he left the 99 because his love caused him to pursue the one. So yes, there are seven plus billion people in the world, but maybe today you are the one. You who used to walk with God, but then you walked away. His loving kindness is drawing you back. You, who ended up divorced and have guilt, shame, and remorse over this, and you feel unworthy, God's loving kindness is drawing you back to himself. You, who have never really been part of a church, something is happening today, and something is drawing you toward God. That is his loving kindness drawing you toward himself. You who have a pornography problem and you feel dirty and unworthy, God doesn't just love you, but he is loving you right now. Because love is not just something that he does, it is who he is. You who have been an atheist all your life, but now something is rising up inside of you. That is God loving you because it's not just something it's, he, he does, it's who he is. God is love, and maybe you are the one he is pursuing today. God so loved the world. John three sixteen. most of us know it by heart. I took out the world in your outline and left it blank because I want you to personalize it today. For God so loved Marcus. For God so loved Tim, or for God so loved Taylor, or, or God so loved Tom, whatever your name is, fill in that blank with your name. For God so loved you that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. Because love is not just something that God does. It's who he is. One of the things that really helped me understand God's love more is when I had children. Uh, you see, when I had one child, you know, Reagan at the time, I was overwhelmed with this love for this precious girl. I loved her so much that it, it hurt sometimes. And Reagan is smart and beautiful and witty. But what I love about her most is her intense passion for social justice and helping those 
who need a helping hand. And I remember thinking when she was young, how could I possibly love another child as much as I love Reagan? And then God gave us Micah, super intelligent, almost photographic memory. He is tender and kind. All of a sudden I realized that I could love two children with an equally intense yet very personal love. And then a couple of years later, we were blessed with Aiden. His name means fiery one, and he's certainly a spark plug. Aiden is an animated, spunky bundle of love. He loves giving big hugs and is fiercely competitive. He hates losing. I have no idea where he got that from. And I found even more love in my heart for another, and I loved three with intensity, yet a personal kind of love. And as I start to look at my different children, I can understand how God can love us. Yes, sometimes I feel bad about myself and I feel insignificant, but by being a father and loving children, I can see how God can love you and God can love me in a very personal sort of way. And that's why we can love each other and love him back. Why? Because he first loved us. One time, a little girl came running into her father saying, Daddy, Daddy, did you know God will tell you he loves you if you just listen close enough? And the dad kind of looked on, and the girl looked to heaven, and she smiled real big, and she said, See, Daddy, God will tell you he loves you if you listen closely enough. And the dad thought to himself, I didn't hear anything. But then he realized, maybe he wasn't listening close enough. God will tell you he loves you because it's not just something he does. It's who he is. If you will listen closely enough. Let's pray. Oh God, we ask that in this holy moment that we would be overwhelmed and overcome with your unconditional love. Those of you praying with me, I know many of you feel unworthy, undeserving, insignificant, and your prayer may be similar to mine. God, I want to know your love in an intimate way. I want to know the power of your love and grace. Show it to me that I could be forever different. For you who really battle with insignificance, just pray, God, I want to know your love in a more intimate way. And God, I want to pray right now that as we, the body of Christ, hear your word taught, as we worship, as we serve in our community, as we fellowship with other believers, and as we reach out to those who don't know you, Lord, may your love become so real to us that we can't miss it. And God, I pray that we would be overwhelmed and different because we understand that as believers in Christ, we are living from a position of acceptance, not because of the love of God shown through the shed blood of Jesus because he died and rose again. And out of that place of strength and acceptance, may we live in such a way that we would reflect your love to a world that so desperately needs you. Show us, O God, your love, and may we reflect it in all that we do. As you keep praying today, some of you may have recognized that you are the one. You're here. Because God has been working on you. There's something drawing you toward God. And let me tell you what that is. That is the loving kindness of God. And let me just be honest with you. You're going to recognize that you're unworthy. That's the reality. We all are. We're born with a sin nature. And when we do something wrong, we feel that sense of guilt. God feels distant. That's because your sin separates you from a holy God. But check this out. God so loved you that he sent his son Jesus. This is how God demonstrated his love for us, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the message of the gospel. That's why the gospel means good news. And here's the good news, that you can never work your way to God, but God made his way through his son Jesus to you. That's why today there are those of you who are being drawn to God and you recognize that you're the one. You're the one that God's been reaching out to. So what do you do? You simply acknowledge it. Ah, Jesus, I'm a sinner, and I believe you're the Son of God, that you are the manifestation of the love of God, that you died and you rose again so that I could live forever, and today I call on your name. And let me tell you what happens when you do. 
you will be changed. Your old life is gone. Your sins will be forgiven by God. You'll be filled with the Holy Spirit as you begin following Jesus daily with your life. If that's you, will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I am a sinner and I need a Savior. Jesus, forgive me, make me new. I believe you died for me and rose again so I could live for you. Fill me with your Spirit. Empower me to know you and to serve you. Show me your love and help me show it to the rest of the world. Thank you for new life. Now you have mine. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Hey, if you prayed that today or you have questions about God or if there's any way we can serve you, please text us at 859-459-0443. Before we go to the Lord's table and continue with worship as we regularly do, we want to pause here for just a moment. Today is All Saints Day. At First Christian Church for Sales, we have a tradition of using this Sunday to give particular thanks to God for those saints of Christ who went before us. If we were all, you know, in person and able to do this safely, we would have candles out for everyone to come light in honor of someone they loved who has passed away in Christ, and we can't do that this year. But you are welcome to light a candle at your home when I light one here as a symbol for all of us. So in just a minute, I'm going to light this candle in honor of Chuck Hughes, who passed away in February. Chuck and I shared the same August 9th birthday, but more important, Chuck was a brother in Christ who dearly loved his family and his country. Chuck served us in the Korean War where he was gravely wounded. After a long period of healing, Chuck resumed civilian life, marrying Ivy Hughes and having two beautiful daughters and two grandsons. And while I only knew Chuck in the last quarter of his life, I found him a mostly quiet but hard worker His eyes would shine when he got to talk about his family. Several years ago, one day out of the blue, he opened up about his younger life after he was wounded. He shared some amazing stories that I'm going to choose to keep to myself this day. It's men and women who have gone before us, like Chuck, that we remember on this day. Men and women who lived their lives in such a way that it demonstrated the reality of the good news of the gospel. And so at your homes, if you can physically light a candle in honor of someone right now, that's great. We hope you would do that. Join me in doing that in just this second. But before you do that, or if you don't have a candle, first think of someone who has died before you and has shown you the way of Jesus. And we'll have a moment of silence. Our Lord Jesus, on the night he was to be betrayed, took bread, and after he had given thanks for it, he broke it, saying, This is my body, which is for you. Take and eat. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sin. As often as you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. For whenever we eat this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death and resurrection until he comes again. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, there's so many things in our lives now. Many of us are simply lost or hurting for so many reasons. Feeling helpless. Also, though, Lord, many of us are found in healing, celebrating things that we've overcome, enjoying the praises, Lord, that you have bestowed on our lives as well. Whatever we're experiencing, it is so hard for us to give all this to you, God. We take this time at the table as we partake of these elements to remember 
that you are the Lord of our lives. As we give those, so as we partake of this bread and this cup, we thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please join me in the Lord's Prayer, which He taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please join me in partaking of the elements.